Hey guys, this is Miss Arlequin, and in this video we are going to be reading a test passage and going through the questions. This is a passage that came from the 7th grade New York State ELA test from the year 2016. How to Fix School Lunches by Peg Tyree and Sarah Stavely O'Carroll. Celebrity chefs, politicians, and concerned parents are joining forces to improve the meals kids eat every day. For George Colazzo, executive chef for the New York City Public Schools, coming up with the perfect jerk sauce is yet another step toward making the 1.1 million school kids he serves healthier. In a little more than a year, he's introduced salad bars and replaced whole milk with skim. Beef patties are now served on whole wheat buns. Until recently, every piece of chicken the manufacturer sent us was either breaded or covered in a glaze, says Colazzo. Brandishing the might of his $125 million annual food budget, he switched to plain cutlets and asked suppliers to come up with something healthy and appealing to put on top. Colazzo tastes the latest offering. The jerk sauce isn't overly processed and doesn't have trans fats. Too salty, he says with a grimace. Within minutes, the supplier is hard at work on a lower sodium version. A cramped public school test kitchen might seem an unlikely outpost for a food revolution, but Colazzo and scores of others across the country, celebrity chefs and lunch ladies, district superintendents and politicians, say they're determined to improve what kids eat in school. Nearly everyone agrees something must be done. Most school cafeterias are staffed by poorly trained, badly equipped workers who churn out 4.8 billion hot lunches a year. Often the meals, produced for about a dollar each, consist of breaded meat patties, french fries, and overcooked vegetables. So the kids buy muffins, cookies, and ice cream instead, or they feast on fast food from McDonald's, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell, which is available in more than half the schools in the nation. Vending machines packed with sodas and candy line the hallways. We're killing our kids with the food we serve, says Texas Education Commissioner Susan Combs. As rates of childhood obesity and diabetes skyrocket, public health officials say schools need to change the way kids eat. It won't be easy. Some kids and their parents don't know better. Home cooking is becoming a forgotten art, and fast food companies now spend $3 billion a year on television ads aimed at children. Along with reading and writing, schools need to teach kids what to eat to stay healthy, says culinary innovator Alice Waters, who is introducing gardening and fresh produce to 16 schools in California. It's a golden opportunity, she says, to affect the way children eat for the rest of their lives. Last year, star English chef Jamie Oliver took over a school cafeteria in a working class suburb of London. A documentary about his work shamed the British government into spending $500 million to revamp the nation's school food program. Oliver says it's the United States' turn now. If you can put a man on the moon, he says, you can give kids the food they need to make them lighter, fitter, and live longer. Changing school food takes time, more than a decade, when local restaurateur Lynn Walters lobbied school board members in Santa Fe, New Mexico, to provide kids with healthy alternatives to soggy pizza, they refused. So Walters and parent volunteers began an in-school cooking class. Armed with an electric griddle and a bag of fresh produce, they taught fractions using measuring cups and discussed nutrition over bunches of kale, while concocting such lunch alternatives as spinach fettuccine and black bean tostadas. The teachers loved it, so did the kids. But getting the entrees on the school menu was another challenge. The school kitchens there, like many around the country, were equipped to reheat food, not to prepare it. I was passionate, but I was ignorant of the realities the school was facing, says Walters, who got a grant to buy knives so the school cooks could at least peel and chop fresh fruits and vegetables. Changing school food will take money too. Many school administrators are hooked on the easy cash, up to 75000 annually, that soda and candy vending machines can bring in. Three years ago, Gary Hirschberg of Concord, New Hampshire, was appalled when his 13-year-old son describes his daytime meal, pizza, chocolate milk, and a package of Skittles. 
I wasn't aware Skittles was a food group, says Hirschberg, CEO of Stonyfield Farm, a yogurt company. So he devised a f vending machine that stocks healthy snacks, yogurt, smoothies, fruit leathers, and whole wheat pretzels. So far, 41 schools in California, Illinois, and Washington are using his machines, and a thousand more have requested them. The schools don't make as much money. Kids spent about half as much on granola bars as they did on Fritos. But, Hirschberg says, schools have to make good food a priority. Some states are trying. California, New York, and Texas have passed new laws that limit junk food sold on school grounds. Districts in California, New Mexico, and Washington have begun buying produce from local farms. Las Vegas parent Terry Janison says real change can be incremental. After three years of lobbying, the cafeterias there now sell reduced fat muffins. The soda and candy in the vending machines have been replaced by juice and beef jerky. Doritos were banned, but then replaced by baked Doritos. It's not perfect, says Janison, but it's a cause worth fighting for, even if she has to battle one chip at a time. All right, guys, now it's time to look at the questions and to see if we can figure out what the right answer is. So the first question is question 36. Read these sentences from lines 13 through 16. A cramped public school test kitchen might seem an unlikely outpost for a food revolution, but Colazzo and scores of others across the country, celebrity chefs and lunch ladies, district superintendents and politicians say they're determined to improve what kids eat in school. Which central idea is supported by these sentences? All right, so basically, if I think about the gist of what I just read, I learned that there are a lot of people who are trying to improve school lunch. That's the basic, and they even have a test kitchen where they're testing out the food, and they're referring to it as a food revolution. It's, it's not easy to make changes in the school lunch program. This might be true, but it's not 100% true, and there's nothing here that says it's difficult. Um, well, actually, no, it does. They say that it's cramped. Hmm. But that's not what the main idea of these lines are. It's only the word cramped that makes you think that it's difficult or that it's not easy. So, again, central idea has to be what all of the lines are about or the entire sentence. And here it's really just one word. The rest of it is about how they're trying, not that it's difficult. Public schools have become test kitchens for improving the American diet. They say there is a test kitchen. That doesn't mean that there's a test kitchen in every public school. So no, this is um, taking one specific detail and generalizing it so that it applies to everything. You can't do that. That's kind of like what racism is based in, right? You see something in like a couple of people and then you think everyone in that group is the same way. Many people have been seeking to improve the nutritional value of school lunches. Yeah, many people, chefs, lunch ladies, superintendents, politicians. This is probably the answer. D, educating students about nutrition can improve their health for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that's probably true, but these lines are not about that. So the best answer is C. 37, read this sentence from lines 16 through 18. Most school cafeterias are staffed by poorly trained, badly equipped workers who churn out 4.8 billion hot lunches a year. That is a lot. They're churning them out, and it's all of the words in the sentence are very negative. Poorly trained, badly equipped. What is the phrase churn out? Based on all the negative connotations of all the other phrases, I'm going to look for a question that also, um, an answer choice that also has a negative tone. Remember, that's part of process of elimination. When you see the tone of the question is positive or negative, you want to look for the same thing in the answer choice. They are mass produced without careful planning. Yeah, poorly trained, badly, this seems like, this is negative, this seems like it could be the answer. They are easily prepared. This is positive. This cannot be. It doesn't match the tone. They are economically made and include nutritious ingredients. That's positive. Can't be it. They are thoughtfully, that's positive. I mean, this really shows you that when you notice a negative tone, you really can very easily find the answer, especially if all the other answer choices are the opposite of the tone. They're mass produced. They're churning them out. Negative and a negative. Question 38. Read this sentence from lines 24 and 25. As rates of childhood obesity and diabetes skyrocket, 
Public health officials say schools need to change the way kids eat. Okay, so what is this about? There's a lot of overweight children, a lot of disease, diabetes is skyrocketing, so it's going up and up and up. Public health officials say schools need to change. All right, so we got to do something about it. We got to stop the obesity. We have to stop the diabetes. Why should this information be included in a summary of the article? Well, the article is about how healthy lunches are important, and that's not what they're really doing in schools, but they're trying to change it. This is another reason why we should change it or fix the school lunch to try to solve these problems. Is it predicting the consequences of current eating habits for students? Well, not every student is going to have this consequence. And not every student is eating poor. It's true the school lunches aren't that great, but this is kind of extreme where they're saying like every student has these poor eating habits. So I don't really think that this is the answer, but it is very tempting because it could relate to this. All right, so I don't, I'm not going to eliminate it, but I'm hesitant to pick it, especially if there's a better answer coming down. It emphasizes the importance of healthy meal options for students. Well, okay, so let's think about it. When you emphasize something, you elaborate, you give an example. Like if I say Miss Arlequin loves chocolate, I can emphasize how much I love chocolate by giving examples of how I eat chocolate in my daily life, all the different ways. How do I know that it's important for us to have healthy meals? Because if we don't have healthy meals, children will be obese and we'll have diabetes. So this is definitely a good way to emphasize with a negative consequence. It suggests that schools are responsible for diseases related to eating. This is an assumption. I mean, the schools might not be helping, but they're not putting all of the blame on the school. Even the rest of the article doesn't put all the blame on the school. It talks about eating habits at home, people not having home-cooked meals. So this is not correct. It highlights the role school administrators have in teaching healthy habits. No, it says we have to change the way kids eat, but it's not highlighting their their role. This is not, I and mean, this is a very tricky question, but I feel like the best answer is B. A was tempting. I mean, C and D were kind of tempting too in a way. B is the best answer though. All right, 39. Based on lines 24 through 30 of the article, what is an obstacle to improving nutrition outside of school? All right, let's go to those lines. You can see that it's going to be on page 1, 24. All right, here we go. We want to look here. As rates of childhood obesity and diabetes skyrocket, public health officials say schools need to change the way kids eat. It won't be easy. Some kids and their parents don't know better. Home cooking is becoming a forgotten art, and fast food companies now spend $3 billion a year on TV ads aimed at children. Along with reading and writing, schools need to teach kids what to eat to stay healthy, says culinary innovator Alice Waters, who is introducing gardening and fresh produce to 16 schools in California. It's a golden opportunity, she says, to affect the way children eat for the rest of their lives. So schools need to help affect and change the way children eat for the rest of their lives. Okay, so what is an obstacle that's standing in their way? All right, I got to go back. I didn't really focus on that. What is an obstacle? Um, well, one is home cooking. Home cooking is becoming a forgotten art, so they're not really cooking at home. And the advertising by fast food companies is very overwhelming. It's hard to escape it. So I'm looking for one of those answers. Families do not make time to cook meals at home. Yes, that's true. Kids enjoy watching ads for fast food. It never said they enjoy. They just said that the ads are, um, the ad companies or the fast food companies spend a lot of money. Health officials hinder meal planning by parents. It never says that. Kids do not know how to grow fresh produce. It doesn't say that. It just says the schools are going to start teaching them how to do that. So A is the one that matches the text evidence the best. 40. How do lines 36 through 46 mostly contribute to the development of ideas in the article? Okay. Well, a question like this is really asking us to look at the central idea, and we know that the central idea is that schools need to serve healthier food. They need to change the types of foods that they're serving. They have to get better. How does this paragraph help develop that idea? In other words, if we took this paragraph out of the article, what information would we not have? 
Okay, so changing school food takes time. More than a decade ago, when local restaurateur Lynn Walters lobbied school board members in Santa Fe, New Mexico, to provide kids with healthy alternatives to so soggy pizza, they refused. Okay, so at first the board refused. So Walters and parent volunteers began an in-school cooking class. So they had an obstacle that the school board didn't want to change the food. They overcame the obstacle by starting cooking classes. Armed with an electric griddle and a bag of fresh produce, they taught fractions using measuring cups and discussed nutrition over bunches of kale while concocting such lunch alternatives as spinach fettuccine and black bean tostados. So they used it to educate them in food, healthy food, in cooking, in math. The teachers loved it, so did the kids. Okay, that's important. But getting the entrees on the school menu was another challenge. Okay, so even though the kids and teachers loved it, what else stood in their way? The school kitchens there, like many around the country, were equipped to reheat food, not prepare it. They probably only had microwaves because that's what people usually use when they want to just reheat food. It's not really cooking. I was passionate, but I was ignorant of the realities the school was facing. Says Walters, who got a grant to buy knives so the kitchen school cooks could at least peel and chop fresh vegetables and fruits. All right, so it seems like this was about how they dealt with the obstacle, how part of the obstacle was not having kitchens that were good enough for actually making meals. They show how restaurateurs can get involved to improve school lunches. No, yes, one restaurateur got involved, but that's not the point of that paragraph. They show how easily students accepted healthy changes to school food. I mean, the students loved it, but does that mean they easily accepted health changes? I don't know. It's tempting. You know what? Even though this might be true, is that the point of this paragraph to prove that the kids got on board? No, because then what about all those sentences about the obstacles? This is not how it mostly contributed. This is part of how what we learned in the paragraph, but it's not central idea of the paragraph. When it says mostly contribute, you want to think about what the paragraph is mostly about. What's its purpose? They use the Santa Fe School District as an example of how changes happen gradually. Okay, this is very tempting, actually. They explain why a Santa Fe School District did not serve fruits and vegetables. No, it does not explain that. Um, C is obviously the answer. All right, 41. Based on lines 43 through 46, which statement about school kitchens is most likely true? All right, again, we got to go back. A lot of going back with this passage, but oh, thank God we already read these lines. It is the second half of the paragraph that we just read. This is 45, 44, 43 starts with the sentence about the school kitchens like many around the country, were equipped to reheat food. This is the part that's about the obstacles that exist in the kitchen, that they don't have the right equipment. Okay. They do not have professional cooks. No, equipment. They have too little time to prepare healthy foods. Mm, no, equipment. They are not equipped to serve fresh foods. Yes, they basically only have microwaves. That's what's being implied. They contain older equipment that should be replaced. Ooh, this, I think, is a distractor. That is a really tricky, very tempting answer. The reason I know that it's not the correct answer, even though it kind of hooked me and called to me, is that they never have any words that imply that the equipment is old. You can have a brand new microwave. So this is the trick. It is definitely C, but very, very tough question. Really good distractor. I got to give it to the test makers on that one. 42. According to lines 47, 47 through 56, why is cost a factor in changing school food? Okay, back again. Really tough, all this going back and back and back. All right, so changing school food will take money too. Many school administrators are hooked on the easy cash that soda and candy vending machines can bring in. Okay, so they make a lot of money from unhealthy candy and soda. Three years ago, Gary Hirschberg of Concord, New Hampshire, was appalled when his 13-year-old son described his daytime meal, pizza, chocolate milk, and a package of Skittles. All right, it's not healthy, but it sounds really good. I wasn't aware Skittles was a food group. Okay. All right, so he made a vending machine with healthy snacks. 
a lot of people are ordering them. The schools don't make as much money. All right, but well, that's kind of good. That's kind of bad from the school's point of view. I can see where like the principal or the school board might be unhappy. Kids spend about half as much on granola bars as they did on Fritos, but Hirschberg says schools have to make good food a priority. So the obstacle is that, like, as a school, do you really want to lose all that money? You have to be really committed to changing the lives of children and what they eat to give up that money. You have to basically care about the children and their health more than money. Schools receive income from the sale of popular but unhealthy vending machine snacks. Yeah, that's true from the paragraph. Schools across the country have to buy new vending machines to sell healthy snacks. I mean, that's true, but that's not what the problem is. It's that they make more money from the unhealthy vending machine. Schools have less money to buy healthy snacks from vending machines, or students have less money. No, it actually costs the students. All right, well, it does cost more money. No, wait a minute. That's not what it said. All right, I'm confusing myself. Let me go back to the lines. <coughs> All right, it says that students, the school doesn't make as much money. What does it say about the students, though? Hmm. Oh, I see. Here it says kids spend about half as much on granola bars as they did on Fritos. Well, that basically just means that kids aren't buying the healthy snacks. It doesn't mean they can't afford it. They probably just don't buy it because, yeah, most kids don't want to choose a granola bar over something delicious like potato chips. So this is not the answer. New vending machines stock healthy but expensive snacks. Again, nobody said the snacks were expensive. They just said that students are not necessarily buying them. So the correct answer would be A. All right, as usual, you can see these questions really do take a lot of thought, some tricky answers. You really got to go back into the passage. And you got to think it through. Remember, the biggest thing is you don't want to choose the answer that is the assumption. It has to be 100% true, not something that might be true. Assumptions are things that might be true.